Hi, friends of the US Navy and the Surface Navy. Today, uh, we're going to do a program here that focuses on what's called DISCA, Defense Support of Civilian Authority, and uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief as well. Um, of course, you may be aware that the USNS Mercy recently uh, stood up for a mission in Los Angeles, as well as the USNS Comfort in New York. Um, there's actually a lot more to that. And so we're joined by several people today um, to talk about how some of that mission happened, some of the history behind DISCA, and uh, you know, how important it is for these relationships to be forged across our area and across our country. So uh, we're going to start out. I'm going to do some quick introductions. Um, Admiral Shatinsky, give us a, just a little short background about who you are. Hi, I'm Mike Shatinsky. I'm a retired uh, Navy two-star admiral. I'm currently the chairman of the board for the National Museum of the Surface Navy at the Battleship Iowa. I'm also on the board for the Surface Navy Association and the president of our local Surface Navy Association chapter, the Battleship Iowa chapter. Um, I served 37 years in uniform, graduated from the Naval Academy in 1979. I'm um, a Surface Navy sailor, uh, served on a variety of uh, ships and boats from the Battleship USS New Jersey to uh, the Coastal River Rainforest. And I've uh, been involved in uh, the Navy's humanitarian assistance disaster relief effort um, from both sides uh, over the course of my career and have a, have a, a pretty good experience with it. And I'm, uh, I was excited to be, to see what happened uh, with the, uh, the Navy support for LA during this uh, COVID crisis. And uh, Captain Dan Covian. Hey, Camp Dan Covian, a Commodore Destroyer Squadron 21 uh, out of San Diego. Um, enlisted in 1988, electronics technician on a fast boat submarine out of Point Loma. Uh, got picked up for one of the many commissioning programs and um, currently the uh, Commodore of a six ship kind of squadron here. And, and um, I had command of USS Spruance out of San Diego as well. Over. Thank you, Dan. And Commander Brian Sauerhag. Hey, Jonathan. Uh, so I'm Commander Brian Sauerhag. I'm one of the DISCA planners at US Third Fleet. So uh, background in DISCA was a um, I was the Expeditionary Strike Group 3 DISCA planner for three and a half years before I got to Third Fleet. Uh, so on the West Coast, the ESG-3 is really kind of what we, the, the unit that we go to for DISCA because we look at large earthquake response. So using our landing craft, hovercraft, and those things to go ashore. So I had the pleasure of working on that with the cities of LA, San Francisco, San Diego, and then our folks up in Oregon and Washington doing earthquake response. And then as I transitioned over to Third Fleet, I continued to do the DISCA planning there. And then about a year and a half ago, I was out in Guam for Super Typhoon U2, supporting the Navy region out there as in Task Force West. So that was my first actual DISCA response. And then this year, as we supported the COVID operations uh, for California here uh, in the LA basin. Thank you. And then uh, Captain Larry Vasquez, uh, Navy retired. Good morning, uh, Larry Vasquez, uh, retired from the Navy about two years ago now and started as the Director of Military and Veterans Affairs for Mayor Garcetti in the city of Los Angeles. During my Navy career, uh, I was trained as a Navy helicopter pilot uh, and had the honor of commanding HSL 45 in San Diego, as well as uh, Naval Base Ventura County. And, and I've been with the city now for about two years. Thank you, Larry. And of course, my name is Jonathan Williams. I'm president and CEO of the Battleship Iowa Museum, National Museum of the Surface Navy, and as well as president of the LA Fleet Week Foundation. Um, so we're going to go ahead and kick this off. I'm going to turn it over to, to Mike Shatinsky and the rest of the team um, to talk about the history of DISCA and natural, natural disaster response. So uh, Mike, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I'm going to go way back in history for this, uh, my, my short introduction. Um, our US military has had a long history of supporting the civilian authorities uh, when, when trouble has arisen. Uh, George Washington, our first president, sent the US military to help in something, assist civilian authorities in something called the Whiskey Rebellion in 1794. And uh, in that case, George Washington made it very clear to the military when they deployed, they were not there to take charge and oversee operations. They, they, they were there to support the civilian authorities. And that's, um, that was the ba is the basis of how our, our military works during a disaster and a humanitarian assistance type action inside of our country. Over the years, that's evolved um, during the Civil War. <clears throat> and and <clears throat> subsequent to that, <clears throat> our military 
has supported the civilian authorities, and that's evolved. Uh, a law called Posse Comitatus was passed after the Civil War that really restricted what the U.S. military can do. And, and it goes back to what George Washington tasked our military to do in the past, uh, it, a couple hundred years ago, which is be there to support civilian authority when needed, and we are the last resort. <clears throat> Great. Thank you, Admiral. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Brian. I mean, you know, what, from a DISCA standpoint, you've been pretty much involved in it for some years now. And uh, so why don't you kind of explain missions goals uh, and, and some of your work with the Expeditionary Strike Group and Third Fleet and how you think that really improves um, our country's ability to respond to disasters and other large events, those types of things. Uh, so, so what you'll hear a lot of times, Jonathan, in DISCA is you can't surge trust. So so when you have a large scale event that you know we typically plan to is is the the large earthquakes along the west coast the cascadia subduction zone up in the northwest uh, southern california catastrophic earthquake with in los angeles in the in the southern part of the state and then the bay area earthquake up in the san francisco bay area so so we what we've done is we've tied our disc of planning to our fleet weeks so to, to kind of get some teeth behind the fleet week, a lot of behind the scenes stuff, so so that we can take something away from it. And what we typically do is we we go after one component of a plan. So I think last year for LA, if I'm not mistaken, we did route opening. So we talked a lot about route opening. We want to continue those discussions and what that looks like, because you don't want to try to figure it out what we what we saw in a, in a national exercise in 2016 uh, for Oregon was there were, there were some big plans that talked about landing sites on the coast of Oregon and Washington that we would land at. What we found in the discussions with the local authorities is that they were never really talked to about those landing sites. They were just broad, for example, Coos Bay. Well, where in Coos Bay, where in Newport? So that's when we were able to link up with the county emergency managers so that they could really help drive, like what makes sense? Where, where do you wanna land? Uh, what would make sense, what roads would they want to open and those kinds of things. So we were able to, to work that starting in about 2017, we've done now two landings up in Oregon, Newport, Oregon and Astoria. And I'm, I'm proud to say if, if we wouldn't have COVID right now, we would have done this for Portland Rose Festival. We have completed 17 beach surveys uh, in conjunction with the state of Oregon, Oregon Military Department and the and the coastal counties of Oregon, and we now have 17 sites that have been officially surveyed by the United States Navy that we will be handing uh, those surveys over to the to the state of Oregon. So if there's ever a, a Cascadia earthquake, there's at least 17 sites that we've, we've surveyed that are valid prior to the event that we could rapidly survey again before, before having to go ashore. And, you know, that's something that I've been able to work with ESG and Naval Beach Group and those are the guys that do those surveys and really explain to those admirals and to my bosses at Third Fleet, like, like why that's important, because we don't want to try to figure that out on the fly. And, and, uh, and I think that's really paid off. You know, and I, I kind of going back into some historical examples. I mean, we obviously have some, some major disasters across the world that I think uh, that we haven't, you know, I think the general public may not know how much behind the scenes from a DISCA response effort or, or a Navy response effort may have occurred. So I, I think, Mike, you mentioned that you may want to bring up some examples of some of those historical points that, that may, you know, highlight what the impact is to our population and, and really kind of show the general public what may have occurred behind the scenes to, to help support or respond to something like that. Sure. <clears throat> Well, our, our Navy has been uh, uh, part of the soft power of the United States of America from the very beginning. Uh, people think hard power, fighting wars, that sort of thing, fighting pirates. But the reality is that our Navy is uh, prob probably does more uh, disaster relief, rescues at sea, res refugee assistance, emerging, emerging medical assistance, and things like that um, than we do anything relating to hard power. Um, every day, uh, our Navy ships are out there and doing some kind of uh, soft power event, rescuing, again, rescuing uh, people lost at sea and so on. Uh, from a disaster relief perspective, our Navy has done this again and again and again, uh, both overseas and in our own country. And most people may hear more about the overseas actions and some unique instances in, in, in our own country, but um, it's pervasive. Um 
Commander Sauerhag, let's let's talk a little bit. I know there was some challenges as we, uh, you know, I think behind the scenes challenges that folks may have not noticed. And um, Captain Kobe, and you may want to chime in on this as well as Larry. Um, you know, th that kind of chain of events that occurs. It's not as simple as um, one day, you know, we <clears throat> deploy a, a hospital ship and three days later, the hospital ship arrives. There's, there's actually a, a string of events that occurs from um, the local side all the way up into the federal side, and, as well as some after effects string of events as well. So um, I'm gonna let both of you guys take it on and then and Larry chime in from any of the city side, um, but really take on that kind of chain of events that occurs to get to that point, that it's not as simple as a hospital shows up on a, a Friday morning and that's how it goes. So, John, I'll, I'll kind of try to walk you through how I understood the process. Um, so the states, what you, you'll see is a state has a shortfall. So for this example, uh, uh, it appeared that Washington State and the state of California both saw a potential shortfall in hospital beds uh, coming. Uh, so so they, they didn't see any, any way that they could fix it. So they actually went to the federal government. So the governor went to FEMA and said, hey, I'm, I'm going to need some help with, uh, with hospital beds. Uh, now, that could be in many forms. So typically, we, we don't ask them, we don't want them to ask for a specific asset. So if you looked in the, on the military side, they asked for field hospitals, and then the hospital ships got, got brought into that mix. So at, at the highest levels of government, you know, there had to be some decisions, because I think you had in your questions, we did, we were doing planning to go to, to go to, uh, sorry, to go to, uh, Washington State to go to Seattle and had it started some of that initial planning and uh, and then kind of later in that process we, we got shifted over they had made the decision that the LA area was the most at risk and may need may need those those beds even greater need than than Washington State so so once that decision was made then we started the planning with the state um, you know, the, the on the ground planning that the ESG guys did with yourself and with the city of Los Angeles, really akin to the fleet week. And we really needed to, to work that angle, the force protection angle and, and just the whole ship services and getting, getting the ship to, to the LA area. And then myself, along with our fleet surgeon and two medical planners all flew up to Sacramento and sat down with EMSA, which was the lead on this, the emergency, the California Emergency uh, Management Association, and sat down and, and really explained to them what the capabilities of the ship were. Uh, you know, really it's a trauma hospital and that's how it's structured. How many patients could we have on board? You keep hearing the discussion of a thousand bed hospital, which it is, but half of those beds are bunk beds. So they're really structured to be set up for, you know, your 18 to 25 year old uh, combatant uh, soldier who maybe gets shot or injured and then can be put into a bunk bed. Um, so we really had to walk through a lot of those planning factors with the, with the state to explain what that looks like for the, for the average person. So we were able to get, get a lot of that discussion uh, set up at the state level before the ship arrived. And then, and then clearly lay out that we were going to be there for a surge of non-COVID patients because trying to deal with uh, COVID positives on a ship that has open bay uh, wards for hospital beds would be challenging at best. So, so once we kind of explained all that, the state really understood what, what they ha had, the assets they had, and then were able to leverage uh, testing with something that that was going to be a challenge, right? Because we, we couldn't bring someone on board the ship as a patient and then test them there for COVID-19 and then have them test positive because then you just exposed all the other, the staff and the patients. So we were able to, to, to work with the state on that. Uh, and then they, they linked into to a diagnostics company at Quest, I believe it was, and were able to set up a rapid test for patients in the hospital that they could be tested. They, once they got a negative test, uh, I think it was within six hours they were able to do this, and then they could transfer them to the ship, uh, and then they would they would uh, provide us that that testing. And then the other thing that we were able to work out at the state level was uh, patient transfer. Normally, patient transfers are done uh, hospital to hospital. Uh, the receiving physician and the transferring physician have to agree that they can take that patient, and we were able to to work that through an existing system called the Medical Alert Center 
which does patient transfer for all of Los Angeles County. And we embedded two of our medical planners. Oh, at the end, we ended up having three medical personnel there, two doctors and a medical planner. And that's where the screening all took place. So the initial screening was done at the medical alert center. And then once the patient was deemed as uh, a fit for the hospital ship, and then the doctor at the transferring facility would talk to the doctor on the hospital ship. And then that's how the transfer process was, uh, was coordinated. And it, and it worked really, really well. Thanks, thanks, uh, Brian. And so you were you were up in, I guess, the state side, and there was a lot of coordination on the, the local channels. Um, you know, the the from the standpoint of the city, I'm going to turn over to to Larry a little bit of maybe what what you deal with on the the DISCA side or in in that front, and I'm going to go over to you, uh, Captain Kobe, and to talk about on the ground. I mean, obviously, you you really were focused somewhat on the ground or on the water, however we want to put that. <laughs> so uh, go ahead, Larry, talk about from the city angle, you know, some of the, some of the dynamics that exist and some of the challenges that may exist working between, um, you know, cities and the Navy and really, you know, how, how that played into the whole thing and how possibly things functioned easier because of pre-existing relationships or not. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Larry. Sure, and, and going back to a point that Brian brought up, you can't surge that trust. So with respect to the Mercy, once we all thought it was going to go to Washington and then it did get diverted to LA. So one of the first things that I did was reach out to the port and say, okay, Mercy's coming. How are we going to, where are we going to put her? How are we going to stage her? How are we going to provide access? And I quickly linked up with uh, the chief of the port police and had a conversation with him and the expeditionary stripe crew commander who I knew from my time in the Navy. And we discussed um, some of those issues, but the port police, because they had worked with Fleet Week, already had the plans down, right? They had already talked about uh, an exercise, bringing in a, a large ship like that, where they would put it. So they were ahead of the curve there, which was great, uh, because that was one less thing we had to worry about. One of the things that makes uh, DISCA a challenge in Los Angeles is the fact that the port is far away from the city center. Uh, and then one of the, the um, goals of DISCA really is to have the community understand the value of these relationships. Um, because we are in California, there are uh, a, a lot of um, challenges that we face, not only with um, earthquakes, but with mudslides and fires. So we want to ensure that the public uh, is aware of the capabilities that um, the National Guard and the, and the military can bring uh, to a disaster. So it's, it's not only a chance to uh, showcase what the military can do and the capabilities that they bring, but it also gives us an opportunity to talk about emergency management on a larger scale uh, in the city. Great, thank you. Thank you, Larry. And, uh... You know, I, I think that's probably one of the biggest things to highlight out, out of all of this is, uh, you know, and I think from the DISCA side is, is it's not that the military shows up to town one day and takes over your town. They're actually here in support of the local authorities and here to help respond and, and support um, the crisis that may exist and really help out the general public. I mean, we have to remember as general public, we're taxpayers, um, we're paying into that kind of support and it's great, you know, we're grateful that those relationships can be built. Um, through DISCA to be able to respond to a major disaster. So with that being said, of course, you know, uh, uh, Commander Sauerhag, you talked about from a, a, a broad visionary level or a broader level of how this comes together and how it functions and from the city level, um, Captain Vasquez. And so I'm going to turn it over to Cam uh, Captain Cobian because you really uh, were boots on the ground or uh, I don't know what to say, floating in the water, whatever that may mean in, in your sense. Um, but really it's uh, once, once that mission's going, I guess it got turned over into your hands. So I'll turn it over to you to talk about some of that, you know, mission as it, it came off and as you saw firsthand as you were aboard Mercy and some of the challenges you had and some of the great things that, that came together because of it. Absolutely. So uh, DEFRON 21, we were uh, kind of the, the best fit as a command element given where we were in our deployment site. We found out on, on the 18th of March of 2020 uh, that we'd be embarked as a command element on board Mercy for DISCA. And so uh, when we got tapped, 
Uh, we picked uh, 14 people on that Wednesday afternoon and we started getting real smart. We reached out to SMEs or subject matter experts like Brian Sauerhag, kind of walked us through the process and what that would look like. I went down to Mercy, who happened to be birthed right across the street from my, our building. Kind of got, you know, met the uh, medical treatment facility CEO, Captain John Rotruck, and the Mercy Master of Sivmars, working for MSC, Captain John Olmsted, the Mercy Master, and kind of sat down to get a better understanding of how that would work. So we worked, uh, you know, we picked the 14 people off the staff that we thought would be the best fit. We don't know medical treatment, but we know command and control. So we in embarked on Mercy, uh, figured out via, you know, what a, what a your average surface warfare officer would, would do and put all the reports into some kind of a flow chart so we could understand, track, and uh, make the right reports. And our, our goal was to uh, facilitate medical treatment by the medical training facility and their, uh, their, their complement. So we left Mercy with uh, about 800 medical professionals, and that got beefed up once we got up into uh, the Port of Los Angeles to over 1,000. One of the things I saw uh, firsthand was, uh, you know, they're they're getting a thousand people from a, a really countless number of uh, geographic uh, commands and different echelons and different levels of expertise, putting them together and learning how to practice medicine as a team. Kind of, uh, you know, they're they're each experts in their own right and their own specialties, but when you're you're putting together. You go from somewhere less than 100, which is what the Ready 5 status is. So basically, the Mercy and likewise the Comfort exist pier side in a Ready 5 status, which means kind of a minimal crew to maintain the equipment and inventories on the ship for medical, um, medical supplies. And then you ramp up quickly within five days to be available for tasking. Uh, we saw them all grouped together, get on board in a period of five days, uh, the majority of which got on board um, after some screening. Uh, the day prior to getting underway, uh, we got off, got underway the morning of the 23rd of March of uh, 2020. Uh, Mercy ballasted because she has to deballast while she's pier side here at her at her birth. And during that period of time, they were inventorying, uh, breaking out equipment, uh, figuring out what medical teams would, how they would work together, and how they would be identified. And by the time we got to uh, to Los Angeles on the 27th. Kind of established a footprint, did the uh, anti terrorism force protection footprint, worked with the Marines that were there, LA Port Police, the uh, LAPD, uh, the advanced uh, echelon or ADVON team from ESG3 that Commander Sauerhag had mentioned, uh, you know, worked through uh, Third Fleet in the capacity as MCE West and the Fleet Forces in the capacity as NAV North. All those things kind of came together in a handful of hours, I would say. Um, to establish what our normal drumbeat would be. We had daily briefs with third, the Third Fleet Commander, and uh, he was uh, intimately involved in all things having to do with the mission. So my, my biggest takeaway is how, how well it all came together. Uh, you know, we're, we, are, we have never embarked mercy in, in the capacity such as this. Most Ezrons don't. Their uh, limited experience would be something like a Pacific Partnership. And I think Commander Sauerhagen mentioned that previously. But get, in, get embarked establish the C2, establish what the deliverables are, and then get the, the medical team doing what medical teams do and practicing medicine. Uh, I think it, in, at the end of the day, in total, they treated 77 uh, patients on board Mercy. We peaked our max uh, census or population of patients was somewhere around 21 or 22. They did a, a multitude of different surgeries. They, uh, I think at the end of the day, they did 36 different surgeries and that ranged from uh, general to orthopedic to interventional uh, radiation type treatments, um, some skin grafting. So around the, the full spectrum, and the, the, the entire goal was to serve as a relief valve for the local hospitals so they could focus on COVID positive patients. So at the end of the day, every single patient we took on board Mercy opened up one additional hospital bed at one of the local hospitals. Yeah, so my, my biggest takeaway from the mission, I think, was, uh, again, you get over a thousand medical professionals, each, you know, at, at the high end of their game, wherever they're at, whether it's a civilian hospital, at, you know, or if it's a military hospital, 95% of the uh, the FOS crew are fully operational, uh, were at the end game, were active duty, and 5% were reservist, and that varied course after we got underway and we arrived in Los Angeles and they plussed up and waxed and it waned based off of personnel availability but you get all these different people and you put them together and their ability to, to 
establish a team, not just by assignment, but based off their interpersonal working skills and their levels of expertise um, to, 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 to end up as a cohesive medical hospital. Bottom line is it's a hospital that just happens to be on the ship. That was our biggest takeaway uh, as we went through it. But like I said, their ability to kind of get up to speed quickly, learn each other's uh, you know strengths and, and others, and uh, offset those to, to end up in being a fully functional hospital in, in really very short notice. Thank you. Commander Sauerag? Yeah, I think it just goes back to building these relationships prior to an event happening and then being able to face-to-face -face do the planning. So I think you know the all of our experiences with all the fleet weeks and doing our disc of planning paid off in spades because a lot of those people don't rotate out at the state level and then and then being able to go up to sacramento to do the face-to-face -face sit down and really truly explain what the ship can and cannot do was was invaluable and, and then being able to work through the at the state level the things that we needed to, to ask questions about and then and then even you know, as I left the state and it's explaining to my boss why it was important, you know, once the resource has been obtained by the state, you know, it got pushed down. It was a state resource, you know, it was really a national resource, but it was in the LA basin to support. That's where the population center of California is. And it's where they thought the biggest need was going to be. But really explaining to, to the Navy side of the house, why it was important for me to leave Sacramento, come down to, to LA and then, go to the city EOC, go to the county EOC and work face to face with those emergency management professionals because we did need help. And I'll give you, you know, just one small example. We had patients that came to the ship that were homeless. Well, the Navy didn't know what to do with that stuff. You know, what do you do with that person's personal belongings? There's really no place to store it for us. And how, how do you deal with that? But, but going into the city EOC, and working with with the, the law enforcement folks and the homeless outreach folks within a matter of a day or so, the city already has a program in place on how to deal with that. We were able to leverage that, get all the point of contacts from the city, link them up with our Navy folks at the terminal that were receiving the patients. And then we had a process. Now we didn't need to use it, but we had a process in place that the city already had in place. So, so that's the Understanding how the how that system works is invaluable, and, and, and even though I wasn't able to embed into the EOCs, I was at those EOCs initially every single day, you know, talking to the to those folks. And it's hey, do you need something from us? Hey, we we may need some help with this. And and those those relationships when you can walk into that EOC and see multiple people that you've met numerous times is, is invaluable. Great, thank you, Brian. Um, Larry, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, but, uh, what Brian just mentioned about relationships uh, is important. Uh, and I think my role, what I've learned, is a, a continuous education process for me, but also for members of the city and the county as well. Just the fact that, and the state, just the fact that Brian had to go up and brief somebody on the capabilities of the Mercy uh, just shows you that there's, that while they don't trade out uh, very often, the folks at the county and certainly at the city do. So one of the things that uh, I need to continually work on is the educational process for folks at the city. Uh, and one of the things that I was able to do was to arrange a brief by the National Guard on the capabilities that they can bring during a disaster, such as a mobile field hospital. Uh, and that is one of the considerations that we were looking for, uh, looking at if the Mercy did not come to Los Angeles. So it really is about the relationships and the educational process to make folks at the city under, uh, understand the, the planning process and the capabilities that are available to them should they need. Thank you, Larry. And uh, Mike, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let you do the closing statement and wrapping all of this up if that works for you. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make a quick statement on my, my takeaway, or I, I wouldn't even say takeaway, but it was, uh, you know, uh, Brian, you're, you're going to understand this as much as anybody. You know, in the middle of this, uh, Lewis, who is in charge of San Francisco Fleet Week, gave me a call. And, um, you know, we built a great relationship through the Fleet Week side. And, and Lewis called me and said something. He goes, Jonathan, what is, what's it really like? You know, what's it like to actually have a disc response that's been, you know, people have been practicing for years? And my response to him, and, and this is really telling on the relationship side, 
my response to him was, well, it's kind of funny, Lewis. It's like we're all just getting together again like we do every Fleet Week. And it, for me, it was almost uh, a see, all of us that, that work together, um, you know, six months a year and, and planning a Fleet Week and the DISCA exercise. And then all of, sub, all of a sudden, something really happens, but it didn't feel like something happened. It felt like we all were talking to each other again, and we were just right back into what we do every year. Um, which I, in my opinion, made it um, so much more fluid. I couldn't imagine how difficult it would be, you know, from everything from a force protection standpoint and interfacing with the local um, police department, standing up, uh, you know, military force protection to, you know, shore services to relationships, you know, working with the city or the county and people don't know how to work together. I mean, the neat thing was watching everybody that already knew how to work together to get together again and work together like we do every year. Um, and so that was my biggest takeaway was was just realizing that in the middle of a a, a disaster response effort with a you know the response of the mercy it didn't for me personally didn't feel like that it just felt like we were all talking again. <laughs> um, so that's my biggest takeaway on it. For for those of you on the Navy side, it's kind of funny. I mean, twenty years, I've been twenty years with the Iowa at this point, and of course I'm I'm a civilian. Um, so I, I knew very little about the Navy other than my grandfather served in World War II when I entered this in 20 or 2000, year 2000. But over the years, I've built some great relationships with, with folks in the military um, to the point where I've, I've actually become the translator um, internally, sometimes on Fleet Week and things where, where I've had um, some of the local civilian side come to me and said, what did they just say? Um, because the Navy has a tendency, I mean, in the military, that a lot of abbreviations and a lot of things are said. And so I've ended up in that translator. But it's, it's always, you know, when you look at a city or a county or a state department, or you look at any of the government departments, and you look at the, the, the federal side, they all communicate on, on different levels. They look at things from different ways. You know, it's depending on how their constituents or what their primary mission is. Um, and, and I know uh, what we're seeing from a, a Fleet Week front is being able to bring people together on these DISCA exercises has helped build those uh, enormous bridges. Um, I, I think those bridges of communication where it allows both the city and the Navy and the county and the state to, to understand how each other communicates and, and work together closely on that. Um, and I think that, that helps connect to, to, the, to the public in the sense of really, for me, it's, it's a simple thing, um, especially when I start to look at the Surface Navy and the National Museum of the Surface Navy, um, talking about the Surface Navy and connecting to the public. Um, the Navy does a wonderful job. You guys do a great job of motiva motivating your sailors and getting a mission executed. Um, from the standpoint from the public, they don't always know what that means. And, and I like to, to talk about from a Surface Navy side, our trade and commerce does not reach the shores of the United States without you guys making sure that the, the ocean is safe. And um, you know we we couldn't respond to you know the 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 response to the pandemic and you standing up a hospital ship um, that wouldn't have occurred and all of the field hospitals with the National Guard would not have occurred without the resources and the capacity that the military has to respond to that and I think it's important for the general public to understand that that the the military um, is not a branch of the service that that uh, you know any any of the branches it's not something that the military wakes up every morning, and I, I hate to use an analogy, but um, I, I don't know a single, so, uh, a single sailor or soldier that wakes up in the morning and thinks about the first thing to do is run out their door and go to war. I mean, that's, that's about point, I would say that's probably what, 1% of your job, if that, I think the majority of your job really is, is um, supporting our country and, and ensuring that we, you know, we remain free and bring, uh, you know, our trade and commerce across the country and ensuring that we can um, respond to disasters and support our ally partners. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, that's my, my civilian perspective on it, um, is, is that you really are from a, from a Navy and a military and a, a, a federal side um, focused on doing a great amount of good for the world and ensuring that we, uh, we continue to move forward as a, a society. You guys have any comments on that at all? You're welcome to. <laughs> hey, Jonathan, I'll, I'll, I'll respond to that. So yeah, absolutely. I, I would say in the, the mission sets that we, as a, for example, as a destroyer squadron uh, staff train towards, this is not one of them. Uh, you know, one of the takeaways that we uh, talked to Third Fleet about was, you know, maybe because of the normal embarkation being for something like Pacific Partnership, which is more help outside the U.S., 
uh, this becomes one of the normal uh, periodic exercises that the Mercy does to get underway. And maybe instead of them just doing it on their own, you get a off cycle Desron like we were for this Mercy to embark. And to you guys earlier point, um, establish those relationships. It won't be the first time we do it. We know the spaces. We know the uh, the MTF CO, the MTF XO, the Mercy Master, for example. So, from 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 my perspective, this would this this has taught us that we need to uh, to to work towards that and add it into the toolbox of uh, of things we go to when needed. Over. Great. Thank you, um, Jonathan. Just I think yeah, just, for just it, one quick just one quick point. Um, maybe two actually the uh so i think I, I one of the questions i got a lot when i was in san pedro was you know people were seeing the numbers of patients on the ship and it, and it never got that high right so 20 some patients at one time 77 treated but i think you know we had the 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 the, this, the nation had a plan for the worst case scenario and I, what i would tell the the locals whenever i would see them when i was picking up my takeout was that means that what you're doing is working you know, we never wanted the ship to be full. That was never the goal of us, you know, because the social distancing and all those things were put in place, the ship was didn't need to be to be full. The hospitals weren't overrun. So I think that was a was a was it was a good point to to remind people that they did what they needed to do and and that we didn't need to use that asset. The reason it got sent there was because if it didn't go right, there was definitely going to be the potential to have that need. And I don't know how many of you know that we actually scaled off into another mission set. So before Mercy left, um, the state was having some some issues uh, with uh, skilled nursing facilities. So we actually, the state opened a skilled nursing facility in Orange County, and we provided uh, 40 sailors along with some Cal California Medical Assistance Team folks to stand up a, a fixed skilled nursing facility in Orange County called the Fairview Development Center. And then within that, uh, a couple of weeks later, the Navy actually provided um, four strike teams that were one nurse and four corpsmen, along with a state CalMAT leader, hence Defense Support of Civil Authority. So we supported that CalMAT team and we went out into skilled nursing facilities, provided patient care for COVID positives in the facilities along with the CalMAT nurses and and also provided uh, PPE training. So that was something that, that happened all the way up until two weeks ago. Wow. So, so there was another scale off of the Mercy. So as Mercy was still kind of winding down up, and up there, there was another need that we were able to peel off those medical professionals. We all staged out of Orange County. The state had a nice big hub there with uh, protective equipment. And then we essentially ran another command and control node out of there and we were supporting the the county uh through the mac again actually and going out to skilled nursing facilities and helping them with staffing shortfalls and uh ppe training that's great thank you um mike i'm going to let you make some closing statements on this and uh we'll close it out here Make two points in, in closing this, and one is that I think LA Fleet Week has added an incredible value to our Los Angeles community. The Fleet Week here is only four years old, uh, but you see a representation of the value of the Navy and the Surface Navy in particular with this uh, this deployment of the USS of the USNS Mercy. Um, during LA Fleet Week, people don't realize that we have these DISCA exercise events that occur behind the scenes that are transparent to the public. Uh, there are things that also happen called comrails, where the sailors and Marines and Coast Guardsmen leave their ships and go out in the community and uh, interact with the community and may work for Habitat Humanitary or visit off uh, Habitat for Humanity and build hope, um, housing. Uh, they may be at uh, a hospital visiting uh, the patients there on a morale type trip, but they're out interacting with the community. And um, this to me is just a snapshot of what our surface Navy can do. Every day our Navy is out uh, representing America. Uh, America isn't about going to war and winning, although we, we do that when we have to. It's really the soft power of America, which is the greatness of America. It's democracy, it's freedom, it's free trade. Those are the things that make our country so great and make us a model for the rest of the world. When our surface Navy ships, our ships visit, um, 
Ports overseas, they're doing the same things they're doing at Fleet Week. They're doing Comrels. They're uh, providing assistance to those ports. They're representing America. Um, and that's in addition to just keeping our sea lanes safe and allowing our, our economy and the world economy to continue to, to function as it does. Um, these kinds of things happen every day. The Mercy deployment was a, a huge success. Uh, we're blessed that she didn't have to do what she did uh, when she deployed for um, the great tsunami in uh, 2004 in the Indian Ocean when she treated 100,000 patients over the course of six months and, and uh, provided 500 surgeries. And we just didn't have that happen. Uh, we, our country has handled this uh, COVID crisis quite well. Uh, but uh, God bless America. God bless our surface Navy. God bless our Navy. Uh, the Navy provides great value, and this is just a representation for, of that.